<laughs> okay, we're now live. So if uh, everyone uh, can mute your microphone icon, put a slash through that and a slash through your video icon. And um, if you need to control your volume, you do that on your own device and choose a uh, speaker view. It's normally in, up in the upper right with just one bar and you'll get the best view. Uh, if you have a comment or question during our presentation, please just put it in the chat. And uh, you wanna use full screen, of course, to get the best view of our presenter. And our presenter today is Susan Hill. Um, she's a Green Valley resident and we have heard from her before. We heard from her last year um, when she gave a really nice presentation on photographer Steve McCurry, <laughs> uh, Stories of the Human Experience. Susan's forte is art appreciation and communication. And so immediately after her presentation last year, we invited her back. She's supposed to come back in April, but COVID kept us all away. And so now we get the opportunity to hear from Susan today. She'll be talking on Julia Margaret Cameron, Scandalous Victorian Photography. So Susan, if you'd like to get started. Sure. Well, welcome everybody. I'm glad to have you here, although I can't see you. Full screen, okay? Great. All right, you can all see? It looks good. All right. That was our uh, view of the museum. This is our copyright slide. And now we start the presentation. For a new art talk, I wanted to research a woman who came across a website, and I came across a website about early women photographers. Leading the list was a woman named Julia Margaret Cameron who began photographing in 1863 no. when she was 48 okay. years old. Well, that sounded promising. Uh. Then in a brief summary, I read that her style was new and widely criticized in her own day. And I quote, Mrs. Cameron exhibits her series of out of focus portraits of celebrities. We must give the lady credit for daring originality, but at the expense of all other photographic qualities. In these pictures, all that is good in photography has been neglected and the shortcomings of the art are prominently exhibited. We're sorry to have to speak thus severely on the works of a lady, but we feel compelled to do so in the interest of the art. Notice the spots on his cap, and the stray hairs coming out of his beard and his hair. Julia Margaret Cameron was reportedly furious about that um, comments. There's the rest of the hair coming out. Well, I was hooked, an older woman pioneer, photographer, active during the uptight Victorian era, highly criticized by many of her peers. I wanted to know about more about this quote lady, Julia Margaret Cameron, and her shocking, even scandalous photographs. I found her artwork fascinating and very different from any photography that I'd ever seen. I hope you all will appreciate Julia Margaret Cameron. Any research I did, any time I saw her name, it was always two names, Julia Margaret. So that's what we're going by. I hope you appreciate her as much as I have come to do. And I leave it up to you to think about it as we go through the presentation. Is her photography scandalous? or as she described it, high art, or both. In order to better understand Julia Margaret and her photography, it's important that we know a little bit about the Victorian era. It began with the reign of Queen Victoria in 1837 and ended with her death in 1901. 
Queen Victoria's predecessor, King William IV, had lived a life of public excess. He openly fathered children with women he had never married, and he became known as the Rogue King. Queen Victoria modeled her lifestyle and attempted to give the British people an example from the other <laughs> Clothing and behavior in both public and private were modest. Class distinctions were very important. The you can't get it, honey. Join with the elite hanging on to their positions in the face of a rising middle class. The rise in the middle class came about as a result of the Industrial Revolution, which was just concluding when Victoria ascended to the throne. The revolution brought an emphasis on technology and progress and practicality. And in reaction to this, an inclination toward romanticism also appeared in the Victorian era. Julia Margaret Cameron lived and worked in this diverse and ambiguous environment. As we shall see, she was a romantic of the first order. Her work found more acceptance among artists than among photographers. Perhaps her photography had another influence as well. Julia Margaret was born in Calcutta in 1815 in a country that was then referred to as British India. She was one of seven girls. Her father was a high ranking official in the East India Company. Her mother was French, the granddaughter of a man who was a page to Marie Antoinette. Because of the heat and the prevalence of disease in India, British children were often sent abroad to be educated. Julia Margaret spent much of her youth in Versailles in the care of her French grandmother. This portrait that you see was painted in France when Julia Margaret was about three years old. James and Adeline Patty had seven daughters. Along with their mother, six of these young women were exceptionally beautiful. A story is told that one of the sisters, Virginia, once had to sneak out of a shop in Oxford Street by the side entrance because a large crowd had gathered in front just to see her. Julia Margaret, shown here, was the less than beautiful sister. Perhaps that contributed to her pursuit of beauty in her photography. She said, my aspirations are to ennoble photography and to secure for it the character and uses of high art by combining the real and the ideal and sacrificing none of the truth by all possible devotion to poetry and beauty. Returning to India from her education in France, Julia Margaret Paddle married Charles Hay Cameron in 1838. He was a lawyer stationed in Calcutta, a man 20 years her senior. Together, Ray raised 11 children, five of their own, five orphaned relatives, and an adopted Irish girl. In 1848, Charles retired and the family moved back to England from India. They lived in several homes until finally settling on a home on Freshwater Bay on the Isle of Wight. They called their home Dimbola Lodge, named after the family's coffee estate on the Isle of Ceylon. Anne Thackeray, whose photo this is, was the daughter of the writer William Makepeace Thackeray. She was a neighbor and she described life at Dimbola Lodge. Mrs. Cameron seemed to be omnipresent, 
organizing happy things, summoning one person and another, ordering all the day and long into the night, for of an evening came impromptu plays and waltzes in the wooden ballroom and young partners dancing under the stars. This is Cameron's photograph of Ann Thackeray. It's typical of Cameron's more formal or studio-like photo photography. She could do realistic studio photography. She just often chose not to. In 1863, however, there was a lull in activity at Dimbola. Julia Margaret was lonely. She said at one point, I assume vivacity of matter for my own sake as well as for others. Her daughter and son-in-law gave her a, Cameron's, a camera saying, it may amuse you mother to try to photograph during your solitude. This is a picture of Julia Margaret and her only daughter, this daughter that gave her a camera, whose name was also Julia. Here again, you can see the imperfections of early photography. Julia Cameron Norman died of complications of childbirth at age 44. The camera quickly became more than a gift to her. For the first moment, I handled my lens with a tender ardor, and it has become to me as a living thing with voice and memory and creative vigor. However, she added, I began with no knowledge of the art. I did not know to where to place my dark box, how to focus my sitter. And my first picture, I ruined to my consternation by rubbing my hand over the filmy side of the glass. What Julia Margaret was referring to was a very simple camera consisting of two nested boxes. The rear box had a removable ground glass screen and could slide in and out to adjust the focus. After focusing, the screen was replaced with a light tight holder containing the sensitive plates and the lens was then capped. Then the photographer opened the front cover of the holder, uncapped the lens and counted off as many, ooh, sorry, I jumped too far there. Counted off as many second <clears throat> minutes as it seemed to require before replacing the cap and closing the holder. The image appeared on the screen, what we'd call the film of the day. In 1857, before Julia Margaret began her career, Lewis Carroll wrote a parody of Longfellow's poem, Hiawatha, in which he described this complicated photography process. And he wrote, first a piece of glass he coated with collodion and plunged it into a bath of lunar caustic, carefully dissolved in water. There he left it certain minutes. Secondly, my Hiawatha made with cunning hand a mixture of the acid pyrogilic and of glacial ascetic and of alcohol and water. This developed all the pictures. And finally, he fixed each picture with a saturated solution, which was made of hyposulfite, which again was made of soda. Julia Margaret said of learning to use this process, I felt my way literally in the dark through endless failures. Her hands and table linens turned black and brown from all of the chemicals. <coughs> why my slides are not advancing like they usually do. Oh, shoot. 
Sorry, I dropped my mouse. Okay, let's try this again. There he is. Now the next one, there we go. Some of her mistakes in this complicated operation she considered worth saving. In this photo from 1864 entitled Sadness, there is a gap, gaping black triangle in the bottom half where the developer had peeled away from the glass. Blemishes never entirely vanished from Cameron's work and were the cause of much criticism. The criticism said things like those large unshapely heads, body backgrounds, and deep opaque shadows look more like bungling pupils work than masterpieces. Julia Margaret never let the criticism bother her, as she said, considering the source. The lighting here is set to resemble a sculpture of a Roman matron or goddess. In addition to blemishes, the major objection to Cameron's photographs was focus. As one rival photographer wrote, wrote, it is not the mission of photography to produce smudges. Her colleagues argued that photo photography was a mechanical process in which technical perfection was more important than any artistic in intentions. Cameron replied to these criticisms by writing, what is focus and who has a right to say what focus is the legitimate focus? She scorned the definite realistic focus aimed for by other photographers and said that she preferred to stop focusing when she arrived at something which to my eye was very beautiful. Later critics have used this remark to speculate about her eyesight. By contrast, here's a photograph by a very early photographer, William Henry Fox Talbot. It's called Articles of China, taken in 1845, and notice the focus and the detail. And here's a photograph of Fox Talbot himself. Again, notice the detail as contrasted with the photos of Julia Margaret Cameron. This is what photographs were supposed to look like. This is what Julia Margaret's photos look like, what she considered art photography. Posing for Cameron was no easy task. Cameron's studio was a converted hen house on her property. She called it her glass house which was subject to the hot and cold weather on the Isle of Wight. In the words of one woman, one woman who posed for her, the studio I remember was very untidy and very uncomfortable. Mrs. Cameron put a crown on my head and posed me as the heroic queen. The exposure began. A minute went over and I felt as if I might scream. Another minute and the sensation was as if my eyes were coming out of my head. A third and the back of my neck appeared to be afflicted with palsy. A fourth and the crown, which was too large, began to slip down my forehead. The woman in this photo isn't wearing a crown, but you, can you imagine posing like that with your arm up high for a very long period of time? A British photographer curator describes this difficulty. She would set up a thing like this and get the subjects all ready, but then she would have to prepare the negative. You couldn't prepare it in advance and have it in your camera, 
and then got the group set up because the collodion had to be used while it was still sticky. So Sam Cameron had to set the group up, coat the negative with collodion, dip that into a light sensitive chemical, and finally put it in the camera. By the time she had done all that, there was a good chance that the subjects had moved. So Julia Margaret Cameron received her first camera in 1868 at the age of 48. Here are a couple of descriptions of her then. Anne Thackeray, who described life at Dimbola that we already saw, wrote extensively about Julia Margaret and her world. She said, my first meeting with Mrs. Cameron was one summer's day when my father took my sister and myself to see an old friend lately returned from India. I remember a strange apparition in a flowing and velvet dress, although it was summertime, cordially welcome, welcoming us to a fine house and some belated meal. The attendant butler, who was addressed by her as man, was ordered to do many things for our benefit, including bringing back the luncheon dishes and curries for which Mrs. Cameron and her family had a specialty. When we left, she came with us bareheaded with trailing draperies, part of the way to the station as her was her kind habit. The picture is a drawing of Julia Margaret by her brother-in-law, James. She was described by a bi biographer at the point in her life when she became enamored of photography. Cameron was 48, a mother of 11, and a deeply religious, well-read, somewhat eccentric friend of many of Victorian England's greatest minds the painter G.F. Watts, the poets, Robert Browning, Henry Taylor, and Alfred Lord Tennyson, who was her next door neighbor, the scientist Charles Darwin and J Sir John Herschel, and the historian and philosopher Thomas Carlyle. As we will see, photography became her link to many of these personages. The photographs taken by Julia Margaret Cameron fall into several categories, which we'll look at one at a time. Portraits of well-known men of the era, portraits of women, illustrative allegories, photographs of children. This is a portrait of Julia Margaret painted by the painter George Frederick Watts around 1852 before her photography adventure. For a woman who was described as lively, imperious, and energetic, Watts has represented her as meek, morose, and very young, although she was then in her late 30s with six children. Perhaps Julia Margaret Cameron is best known for her portraits of important men in her day. Of this work, she said, when I have such men before my camera, my whole soul has endeavored to do its duty toward them in recording faithfully the greatness of the inner as well as the features of the outer man. As we go along, see if you think she succeeded. We begin with the Victorian painter, George Frederick Watts a good friend and neighbor of Cameron's. Julia took these photos of Watts, changed his occupation from artist to musician and added children, one of whom stares directly at the camera in both photos. The photo on the left clearly demonstrates the title of the picture, The Whisper of the Muse, but the one on the right is considered a better photograph, mainly because of the lighting on the violin and the folds in Watts' waistcoat. Cameron labeled that one in the right hand, a corner, she called it a triumph, 
because she felt she had created a photo worthy of George Frederick Watts. Julia Margaret's powerful portraits are virtually the first close-ups in photographic history. Each was taken against a totally black background showing only the sitter's head and shoulders. But it is her extraordinary use of light that makes these photographs so powerful. This is Lord Overstone, a wealthy financier and a friend and patron of the Camerons. Sir John Herschel was a famous scientist, an astronomer, an expert in photochemicals and a good friend of Julia Margaret's. He was an advisor and a mentor to her as she took up photography. She was eager to take a portrait of him, but Herschel was ailing and didn't often leave home. So Julia Margaret packed up her equipment and went to him. In his diary, Herschel describes two intense and energetic days of photography. The photo is of a head leaning into the viewer featuring dark shadows and bright light. It is said that Cameron convinced Herschel to wash his hair and then she fluffed it up to get the effect of an aura around him. She also emphasized his roomy, far-sighted gaze and the bags under his eyes. Her photos of Herschel are considered by many critics to be among her best works. Another portrait that shows Cameron's unusual style is that of Thomas Carlyle. Thomas Carlyle was a Scottish philosopher, satirical writer, essayist, translator, historian, mathematician, and teacher. He was considered one of the most important social commentators of his time. He was also a man of black and white thinking dividing the world into pure good and pure evil. That rigidity and starkness is clearly shown in this photo. The bright focus lighting also hides his right eye entirely. Cameron's biographer writes, to produce and display a portrait like this required a bold self-assurance in the strength of both her own talent and Carlyle's genius. For a woman photographer who had been accused of being technically inept, the portrait was like a manifesto or a nose thumbing at the photographic establishment. Carlyle himself said as the portrait, terrifically ugly and woebegone, but has something of likeness. Julia Margaret considered it her duty to photograph many of the great men of her time. It is a part of her legacy that's invaluable to future generations and historians. This is a portrait of Charles Darwin. And here is Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And this is a portrait of the poet Robert Browning done in 1865. Cameron's portraits have been described as a combination of romance and mugshot. Sir Henry Taylor was a well-known poet and dramatist in the 18th century. And here he is posed as King David of biblical fame. And Sir Henry Taylor again in one of Cameron's soft focus portraits. Cameron wrote to a friend, quote, the history of the human face is a book we don't tire of. We can get its grand truths and learn them by heart. Here's another portrait of Sir Henry Taylor Cameron consciously experimented with modeling some of her photographs after old masters painting. This one is subtitled a Rembrandt.
Cameron first used the term immortal head for her old friend and neighbor, Alfred Tennyson, her frequent but reluctant subject. Art historian Colin Ford wrote of her portraits of Tennyson, because they never flatter him nor attempt to make him feel urbane or sophisticated, nor disguise the effects of age, illness, introspection, gloom, and even despair, they tell us more about the real Tennyson than all the other painted and photographed portraits of him put together. Tennyson probably realized that Julia Margaret did not flatter him. He dubbed this photo on the left, the dirty monk. On the right is a proper author photograph by John Mayle, which Tennyson chose as the cover for a collection of his works. Notice how neat and tidy the man in the photo is. His collar turned down, his hair cleaned, and uh, shining and nicely trimmed. Not quite as famous, but definitely distinguished looking was Julia Margaret's husband, Charles Hay Cameron. He was once described by Tennyson as a philosopher with his beard dipped in moonlight. Professionally, he was a lawyer serving several legal positions in India, including the Supreme Council of India. He retired when they moved back to England from India. Charles Hay was reserved, good-natured, and indulgent. Julia Margaret was affectionate, impulsive, assertive, a combination that maintained a happy marriage for over 50 years. In this photo, her use of lighting dramatizes his stately dignity and his calm reserve. Her soft focus techniques gives another view of her husband. I wonder what you think. Did Julia Margaret capture the inner man as well as the outer one in her photographs of famous men? William Holman Hunt was an English painter and one of the founders of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. These men claimed to be opposed to the conventional dull art of the day. Julia Margaret was influenced by the Pre-Raphaelites, sharing with them a profound search for truth, an interest in literary subjects, and a blending of romance and realism. This portrait of Holman, titled William Holman Hunt in his Easter Dress, illustrates that blending of romance and realism. You can see romance and realism in a photograph she created titled Decidedly Pre-Raphaelite. See the similarities between, but, between the photo by Cameron on the left and a painting titled Isabella and the Pot of Basil by William Holman Hunt. With similar faces, both are listless women in fancy clothes, languishing in solitude and apathy, usually interpreted as being unlucky in love, typical of women of the Victoria era. Julia Margaret considered her, considered her photographs to be an artistic par with paintings. This photo, Cameron titled dramatically, Call, I Follow, I Follow, Let Me Die, also shows a pre-Raphaelite influence. Another listless Victorian woman. which leads us into Julia Margaret Cameron's portraits of women. Cameron named all of her portraits of famous men after the men themselves, not so with women. She wrote in a letter that men are made great by genius, women are made great by love. 
The women sitters for Cameron were not famous people. She looked instead for women who embodied her ideals of femininity. Most of her female models came from her family, her friends, and her household staff. <coughs> this photo is of Annie, the daughter of a local resident. It was done early in 1864, a little over a month after Julia Margaret got out her camera as a gift. In this note to Annie's father, <coughs> the one you see on the other side of the screen, Julia Margaret calls this her first successful photograph, one that she did by herself from start to finish. Annie went on to marry Julia Margaret's second son, Ewan. The photographer titled this picture, My Ewan's Bride, God's Gift to Us. She adored this daughter-in-law. This photo is of Cameron's niece, May Precept, dressed in finery with her hair elaborately coiffed. There are several feminine symbols here, the Bible on the woman's lap, the candle and the clock portraying time and transients, the bird cage of women's confinement, and the bird symbolizing the nature of women's roles as delicate pets. This kind of domestic scene was common in paintings of the Victorian era, such as this one by English artist, Rebecca Solomon. As I said before, Julia Margaret considered her photographs to be on an artistic par with paintings. <coughs> Here's another question of what do you think? This photograph is titled The Gardener's Daughter. It's a dreamy, tranquil, feminine scene enhanced by the light of the flowers, by the light on the flowers and on the woman. Notice that the world outside the garden is completely out of focus. In Victorian times, gardens for women were areas of safety, but also secure opportunities for illicit romance. In contrast, here's a photo titled Passion Flower at the Gate. Here the woman is in everyday dress, looking longingly out of the gate that defines her sphere. In Victorian garden iconography, artistic works that included fences or gates symbolized women's enclosed, safe from men and also from the outside world. Both this and the previous garden photo allude to feminine virtue, a potent topic for Victorians. A description of proper femininity in Victorian times was found in a poem called The Angel in the House. The poem is the description and celebration of an ideal marriage. In it, women are guardian angels, gentle, humble, innocent, the more childlike, the better. Do you think this photograph captures the poem? Julia Margaret's favorite subject was her niece, Julia Jackson. Julia da Jackson also in incidentally was the mother of the famous writer, Virginia Woolf, and the artist Vanessa Bell. Here I show you two photographs of Julia Jackson, the same pose, but different focus and lighting techniques. You can certainly see how she used different focus and lighting in her photography. Cameron could do both romanticism and realism as these two photos of Julia Jackson show, 
Judging by the clothes, they were probably taken on the same day. The one on the left is soft focus romanticism. The one on the right is more realistic. There are also some of those photographic flaws in the picture on the left. This picture of Julia Jackson was labeled by Cameron, my favorite picture of all my works, my niece, Julia. In this photo, her head is off center looking down. There's strong light coming from the right, highlighting her eye, the bridge of her nose, the curve of her lips, and even the pores of her skin. This is Mary Hillier, <clears throat> Julia Margaret's parlor maid for 15 years and a frequent model posing as the angel at the tomb. Often the women in Cameron's photography were playing roles rather than being photographed as themselves. The roles Cameron chose for photographing came from such sources as biblical stories, Shakespearean plays, and narrative poems. Mary Hillier often posed for Cameron in the rule of Madonna. She again was Julia <coughs> Margaret's maid. This photo is entitled Holy Family. See the lighting that emphasizes the folds of the mother's drapes and lights the child's face. Apparently, Mary Hillier and the other maids spent more time posing and less time being maids. Guests at Timbola often complained about the messiness of the place. And one guest wrote to a friend, we had shocking bad dinners and are obliged to have eggs and bacon to make up for most every meal. This is Ophelia from Shakespeare's play Hamlet. Victorians considered Ophelia one of the most pitiable of Shakespeare's characters. They saw her as an innocent young girl driven mad by the men in her life and her own vulnerability. Does this photograph give you a sense of that Ophelia? This is May Princep posing as Beatrice, a character in a play by Percy Bysshe Shelley. The play called Sensi is based on a true story of a woman who murders her violent husband. She's caught and in this photo seemed resigned to awaiting her execution. In the day before TV and movies, upper class Victorians entertained themselves home in the evening with frequent performances of plays, pantomimes, charades, and other parlor games. According to Cameron's biographer, like music, Bible reading, and family prayers, amateur theatricals were a regular part of a middle class family's evenings at home. They were perfectly suited to large families and large house parties. The more the merrier, the more melodramatic, the better. You certainly can't get any more melodramatic than this photo. It's titled, Pray God Bring Father Safely Home. <clears throat> Some of her illustrations are biblical. These are the wise and foolish maidens. As an expression of her religious faith, Julia Margaret did a series of photos she called Fruits of the Spirit. This is goodness on the left and faith on the right. Meekness and love all using the same models. She also did some Shakespeare. Here are Romeo and Juliet, played by one of Julia Margaret's maids and her fiance. 
This is King Lear with his three daughters. Charles Hay Cameron, Julia Margaret's husband, is Lear. Cameron's seminal work in illustrative scenes was two albums of original photographs to accompany Tennyson's poem, Idols of the King. Arthurian legends were very popular in Victorian culture. Cameron seems to have been the first to bring these legends to life through photographs. Here is King Arthur. Do you think she captures what you think of as King Arthur? This is the parting of Sir Lancelot and Queen Guinevere. Cameron often noted that her photos were, quote, from life. Knowing this, Alfred Lord Tennyson told Cameron to make photographs that are not only from the life, but to the life and startle the eye with wonder and delight. This is an illustration from Idols of the King and is titled, So Like a Shattered Column Lay the King. It shows King Arthur laying in the boat, being made ready to disappear into the mists of Avalon. Early 20th century art critics judged the idol photographs a failure for the blurring of realism and idealism. As one wrote, we believe that in them, Mrs. Cameron attempted the impossible, something that photography cannot and should not be made to do. We have come to realize that pho photography is a most difficult meaning, medium to express imaginative subjects, and that most attempts to illustrate the unreal by a medium whose main contribution to art lies in its realism are doomed to failure. The second volume of Cameron's photos for that poem contained illustrations of additional works by Tennyson. Tennyson wrote a poem called King Photius and the Beggar Maiden. The photo on the right is Cameron's staging of this poem. This early English ballad was also interpreted by the pre-Raphaelite painter Edward Bourne Jones to very different styles of art. Notice especially the position of the king in relation to the girl up in one photograph and down in the other. The association of photography with death was important in Victorian times. Photographs were used to honor the dead in mourning portraits and death announcements. The most frequent subject of these photographs were children, often pictured as sleeping in their own beds. These often became a fetish for grieving parents in an age of high infant mortality. This is a great niece of the Camerons who died at age 10. Some of Julia Margaret's posed scenes also portrayed dead children. This is called the Shulamite woman and her dead son. I'm not clear whether the child in this photograph is really dead or just sleeping. And so we come to the scandalous subject of Julia Margaret Cameron and children in her photographs. She loved children, boys and girls. She had five children of her own and adopted five more to raise. She was always on the lookout for child models. Hear, some of, hear how some of her models describe this. They said, Mrs. Cameron was neither mysterious nor awe-inspiring, but just a kind, exacting, benevolent tyrant. Children loved but fled from her. I can see her now, clad in the never-failing wrapper, 
stains, as were her hands and eager face with the chemicals she used in her work. Her hair falling any way but the right way, lying in wait some fine morning at her garden gate for the young ones passing down the road on the way to the town or to the beach. She's coming, she'll catch one of us. And sure enough, an arm would intercept the passage of some luckless child and bribed by jars of preserve and other toothsome dainty, the victim was led away to spend the sunny hours posing in the studio. This photo is entitled The Infant Bride, illustrating a poem by the same name. The poem describes the engagement of two young children securing peace between two warring kingdoms. Sisters Rachel and Laura Gurney were posed as two angels. 60 years later, Laura still remembers and describes the experience. We, Rachel and I, were pressed into service of the camera. Our robes were no less than two angels of the new tip, our roles, not our robes, our roles were no less than two angels of the nativity. And to just sustain them, we were scantily clad and each had a pair of heavy swan wings fastened to her narrow shoulders. While Aunt Julia with ungentle hand tousled our hair to get rid of its prim nursery look. The title of this picture, Paul in Virginia, is taken from a popular Victoria, Victorian poem of the same name. The poem is about a shipwreck in which Virginia dies because of her modesty, refusing to shed the clothes that dragged her down in the water. The umbrella arm centers the photo and holds the children together. Here are the same children, Freddie and Elizabeth, point, posing as Cherub and Seraphat. According to one curator, Julia Margaret Cameron's objective was always to transform them into paradigms of angelic contentment. Freddie Gould was one of Julia Margaret's most popular models appearing in many of her photos, as you may have noted. This one is entitled, Love in Idleness. <clears throat> Cupid's Pencil of Light. The Young Endymion. Ten years after George, Julia Margaret's death, George Bernard Shaw reviewed one of her exhibitions. And he wrote, while the portraits of Herschel, Tennyson, and Carlyle beat hollow anything I have ever seen, right on the same wall, there are photographs of children with no clothes on or else the underclothes by way of propriety most inartic are inartistically grouped and artlessly labeled as angels, saints, or fairies. No one would imagine, George Bernard Shaw said, that the artist who produced the marvelous Carlisle would have produced such childish trivialities. This photo is called Study of John the Baptist posed by one of Julia Margaret's great nieces. An art historian discusses the presence of touch in Cameron's work. The women and children always in contact with each other. And she says, this touch expresses a pleasure in flesh against flesh that is neither conventionally romantic nor sexual, but located on the same continuum. Described as one of her most sex successful photographs of children is this one of Ernest and Maggie. The sitters have never been identified. 
And keep in mind, again, that posing took an extended period of time for all of these children. Cameron's critic did not find, critics did not find her work erotic as they did other works that they labeled as indecent. Probably she has not been accused of pornography and the exploitation of children because she was a heterosexual bourgeoisie mother and because of her firm social standing in the upper class. Her biographer says, where once art critics saw Cameron as a puzzling anomaly in the history of photography's forefathers, now art historians look back to Cameron as, quote, the mother of all art photography. <coughs> Recent feminist studies have emphasized Julia Margaret's maternal vision this emphasis is probably in part to deflect the problem of the erotic. A demoted mother, it was also her knowledge that she would lose her own children to whom she was very attached as they grew and moved into their own lives. To be a Victorian woman, photographic Victorian women and children upset stereotypes. Instead of the expected classic subject of a young male artist producing an idealized mother, Cameron was an older female artist creating art to show idealized children. Another element in the photography of Julia Margaret Cameron's are the dynamics of power. She almost always took photos of people who were not her social equal, setting up circumstances of dominance and submission, as we have seen in, this, in the discomfort of posing for her. Her bossiness was well known. She combined the roles of eccentric artist and managing mother. This is her maid, Margaret Hillier, with <laughs> Julia Margaret's grandson, Archibald Cameron. Julia liked to believe, or Julia Margaret liked to believe that Mary Hillier, also known as Madonna Mary, was an eager participant in the many scenes in which she was photographed. However, an interview with Hillier in 1920 made clear that she considered the sittings just one more duty imposed by her eccentric employer. Julia Margaret hoped that Tennyson's Idols of the King with her illustrations would be a financial success, but it was not. She pursued both commercial success and high art photography. She wanted it both ways, but the high art photography was her special passion and her contribution to early Victorian photographies. The supplies for this medium of photography were also very expensive. Julia Margaret had an easy come, easy go attitude toward money. She always considered herself a member of the upper class and behaved that way in spite of the lack of financial support. Despite her social standing, by the early 1870s, the Camerons were basically broke. They'd been living largely on credit using the Victorian practice of running up large bills at local providers and paying infrequently. They also borrowed large sums from their sons and from famous friends. Charles Hay by then was almost an invalid and didn't have a job. And so in October of 1875, Charles Hay and Julia Margaret Cameron left England for their coffee estates in Ceylon. Ceylon, by the way, is now known as Sri Lanka. She was 60 and her husband 80. Julia Margaret sold many of their possessions to pay for the trip 
She'd run out of cash, so she tipped the porters with her photographs. Solving their money problems and the fact that four of their sons were already settled in the salon made the move easier. Asked by a niece why she was moving, Julia Margaret replied, where your heart is, there is your treasure also. After three short years in Salon, Julia Margaret died of a bronchial ailment in January, 1879. A popular story says that on her deathbed, she looked out of her window at the evening sky and uttered her last word, beautiful. Her whole life had been a constant search for beauty. Before she died, Julia Margaret affirmed, <clears throat> I long to arrest all the beauty that came before me, and at length the longing has been satisfied. This photograph of her maid, Mary Hillier, is a good example of Cameron's innovative use of focus and lighting to create artistic beauty. Shortly before she left <coughs> England for Salon, Julia Margaret wrote a poem called On a Portrait. In it, she describes her vision of beauty. Oh, mystery of beauty, who can tell thy mighty influence? Who can best decry how secret, swift, and subtle is the spell wherein the music of thy voice doth lie? And the last few lines of the poem sum up the 13 years of photographic work of Julia Margaret Cameron. Genius and love have best fulfilled their part and both unite with force and equal grace while all that we love best in classic art is stamped forever on the human face. Julia Margaret Cameron's study and her place in the history of photography is described by her biography. This is the story of photography's struggle to become an art form and one determined middle-aged woman's struggle to become an artist. <coughs> Despite her famous eccentricities and her singular talent, Julia Margaret Cameron's life and work illuminate the most rarefied parts of Victorian culture and society. She lived within a charmed circle at the center of Victorian culture, and it is in part her own work that keeps the Victorian past before our eyes. This photo of Julia Margaret with her two youngest sons, Charlie and Henry, has been attributed to Lewis Carroll. I've used the word scandalous, obviously, to intrigue and attract you to this art talk, but the word scandalous moves subtly between worlds in a study of Julia Margaret Cameron. Her photography was scandalous in the Victorian world because it used soft focus, dramatic lighting, close-in photography, illustrative scenes, even common mistakes, all the opposite of early traditional photography. We've heard the criticism of lack of skill frequently aimed against her in her time. Her Victorian photographs of lightly clad children can be scandalous in our own time. Our deplorable world of pedophilia, child marriages, violent pornography, domestic violence. I know they were shocking to me when I first saw them. So I leave it up to you. Is the photography of Julia Margaret Cameron scandalous? Is it high art? Is she has been described the mother of all art photography? And does the definition of art 
change with the culture. These are the sources that I used. And this slide how, <clears throat> tells you how to become a member of the Tucson Museum of Art, which really is a grand place. So that's the end of the show. If you all would have any comments or questions, uh, I don't know that I have answers, but we'll talk. Uh, Susan, can um, yeah stop the screen share? And I think Gene is will, still with us to look at the chats he's received. Gene, are you around? Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. So stop the screen share. Yeah. I already did it for you. Oh, he did. Yeah, he did it. I, I couldn't figure out why. Okay. <laughs> um, we have some questions on the right. Holly, can you see them and read them? Okay, um, can you give us a brief explanation of the pre-Raphael movement? I think it was a movement, <clears throat> the pre-Raphaelite um, stuff was a movement that was <clears throat> moving away from the traditional formality of photography and moving into more realistic kinds of um, scenes. Okay, uh, here's another. Thank you for pointing out Cameron's use of soft focus and light, a true deviation from the norm at the time. Uh, how well really was her photography received in her own time? I think it was very um, controversial. I think there were people that thought it was wonderful and there were people that thought it was awful. Um, there was not really a consensus on her greatness until later when the art world went back and looked at her. And that was that um, deviation was by the professionals, professional photographers of the time. That they were the critics, yes. Yeah, okay. Because uh, wow, thank you for both the history of photography, a photographer, as well as insight into the culture of an age. I loved your split screens of two similar poses. Great way to see the techniques. Thank you for sharing your research distillation with us. Lots of work and lots of benefit, lots to benefit from. Great job. Uh, thank, thank you, Susan Hill. Another excellent photography presentation. Next up will be Dano Grayson, Thursday, February 18th at uh, 1.30, same time, 1.30 Arizona time. Dano is a world-class local wildlife photographer. Thank you to Susan for an excellent presentation and to the GVR Camera Club for all the work you do behind the scenes to make presentations like this happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for <laughs> everybody's technical help on your end. Okay, there's some okay. more. Listen to what people have to say about you. Okay. Okay, excellent presentation. Thank you. Yes, culture does influence topic and form. The models were very sober, almost morose at times. This compared to present day photos that expect smiles and happy faces. I didn't see the photos with children in porn. Consider the masters who often had children half clothed was innocent. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Ray, for those who dare to break the rules, the photography rules. <laughs> Excellent presentation. Thank you. An insightful review of history and photography was an excellent experience. Thank you. I guess beauty and erotica are in the eye of the beholder. I think the artist, Cameron, saw the beauty and innocence of childhood and maternal love. Mm -hmm. I think I got them all. Okay, that's kind of what I meant when I said does does our appreciation of our change with the culture and with the times? Yeah, and it does. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was really interesting to see the see that from the Victorian era. Mm -hmm. And your interpretations was most helpful. Take hours. You must have put in hours and days and days of research. Oh, but they're fun. <laughs> okay, so I yeah. enjoy doing them. All right. Well, thank you for sharing. Okay. Thank you, Holly, and thank all of your help there.
Thanks, Susan. All right. Great. Bye, everyone. Hope to see Bye. you next month. Bye. Bye. Thank, Bye. thank you for putting Bye. this Bye. together. Hola, JP.